You're listening to the Scaling Culture Podcast, where we sit down with thought leaders who share their experiences building incredible workplace cultures. Our guest today is Carrie Davis, CEO and founder of Fortress, although she would better describe her focus as being the chief vision officer and chief supporter to her incredible executive team. Carrie pushes the team to solve internal problems with extreme passion, transparency, efficiency, and simplicity, and to do the same for Fortress's clients and business partners. When she's not busy shaping the future of property management, Carrie is loving life in Nashville with her husband and two boys, being a soccer mom, playing Hot Wheels, and meditating. In this episode of Scaling Culture, Ron and Carrie discuss why extreme transparency and vulnerability at the top are the secret ingredients to get to know your employees the balance of overachievement in the workplace, and how to tell when someone is motivated. Why we all need to start reframing tough conversations as acts of kindness, and an exploration on the art of tough conversations, how to let someone go, and why the pre-check-in might be the most important thing you do. Welcome to another episode of the Scaling Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Ron Lovett, and today I'm very excited to have Carrie Davis, who's the founder and CEO of Fortress, on the show. Carrie, welcome. Thank you so much, Ron. I'm so excited to be here with you. Me too. You know, so just to give everyone uh, some background. So I've had the pleasure of meeting Carrie a year ago. I'm not going to get this right, year and a half, something like that. So so in my multifamily business, um, I I don't even remember who introduced us, but I met Carrie uh, through someone who highly recommended her company, Fortress, which is really shaking up the multifamily space uh, in the U.S. And we, of course, are trying to stay ahead of the curve and and met with Carrie's group and and absolutely loved the group, the culture, um, just just it was a very different experience than we had had in the past. And so got to know Carrie through that process. Um, and uh, and here we are today. So Carrie, really excited to dive into a few different topics because um, I'm I, I, I'm I'm excited to learn more about how you run the company. I, I know those around you have an incredible experience, so so I'm really excited to dive uh, deeply into that. Yeah, thanks, Ron. Honestly, I have to tell you, I'm a fan of your podcast, um, so I've I've listened to quite a few episodes, and when uh, you and I discussed me being on your podcast, I was a little overwhelmed. I'm not going to lie. Um, the, your normal guests are by far, uh, much more experienced in, and have the expertise in the culture domain. Whereas, you know, I feel like mine is just something that's evolved over time through my experience with companies, not something I've ever, you know, really focused on or researched or spent time, you know, helping other companies build or drive. Um, so I, I, I'm excited about the conversation, but, um, and excited to share my experience, but in all honesty, I'm, I'm a little intimidated. I'll be very honest about it. <laughs> well, then I will switch my intimidation voice to make that even harder for you. No, I, you know, I, and look, I appreciate the comment, uh, and thank you for that. But, I, but I'll say this, um, sometimes like you're right. Our guests have expertise in certain areas, but, but also sometimes, because uh, we've had some incredible guests who, who who are fantastic, but sometimes there's a disconnect between like, okay, like what's going on in the front lines? And and it's because look, and, and it's fantastic. Uh, and I learn a, a ton from the information, but sometimes it's global businesses that are sorting out very different challenges from these behemoth companies. And so some of our listeners, I think that message can be disconnected. Be like, oh, that, that doesn't apply to me. Uh, and so you're in the trenches. And there's no doubt that you're in the trenches. So before we get into the trenches, go back a little bit. Tell us who Carrie Davis is. You know, give us an overview, bringing up to Fortress, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, my history is a bit of a chaotic one. In fact, when people ask me, you know, what I do or what my background is, I generally say I have actually made a career out of being a troublemaker. And I'll share more on that later. But generally speaking, my background, I I started in um, undergrad studying accounting, actually went to law school. While I was in law school, I actually joined the army. I really wanted to be an international JAG attorney. And unfortunately, while I was uh, in the ROTC program and I spent a summer going through an officer boot camp at Fort Knox, I broke both of my feet. So unfortunately, I wasn't able oh, to continue. I just break, break your feet, sorry. And I'll, and I'll keep interrupting yeah. with very interesting questions or, or be wow. interested in what you're talking about. Yeah, go ahead. I really wish I had a great story. Like I was like jumping out of a helicopter or something. Uh, I didn't. 
I just suffered a stress fracture in one foot and military medicine, let it slip for the next, um, well, a combination of military medicine, not catching it and me being extremely, maybe slightly pig headed, just extremely focused and it passionate about finishing the, the course without needing to drop out for medical reasons. Um, so I, I finished everything, went back to the hospital and found out I had two broken third metatarsals, um, mostly from just the, all the weight that I was carrying and the constant walking and the boots, my body just wasn't used to it. Um, but yeah, no, no great story, just a little too persistent for my own good. <laughs> And so, so, okay, so before you go to the end of the military, and I don't know if you're close yeah. to that, close to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So before you go there, tell me, and, and for people listening, what did you learn? What was the, from that army experience, uh, what were the leadership? What was the culture like? What did you learn to, I need to do more of stay away from and, and, or were you absorbing information like that? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, I actually look back at my time in the military and credit so much of who I am today within that realm. Um, in fact, I joke all the time, uh, drill Sergeant Bryant taught me so much in that short two to three months that I was in training. I think it was uh, 10 weeks and he was ridiculously, um, unrealistic in his expectations of all of us, right? When we were sleeping four hours a night, we were expected to um, get up in the middle of the night and run drills up and down the stairs. And uh, you finish our food in the chow hall within five minutes, and then be back outside doing push-ups again until some people were, you know, throwing up, you know, I mean, it was, it was so unrealistic, but in those moments, you really learned how to lean into your your mental state. So, you know, pushing past what you previously thought you were capable of because someone was constantly setting an expectation for you that was unrealistic. You know, like today we're all so comfortable. Like we, you know, we're never too hot or too cold or hungry or whatever, you know, like we have so many um, things that are just given to us on a daily basis. I mean, even the worst case scenarios, we have to run from our parked car into Kroger when it's raining outside. And like, that's the, the hard part of our day. Um, but like realizing that you actually can get outside of your comfort zone and do these things and challenge yourself and become mentally stronger when you are uncomfortable. It is definitely something that I've taken with me throughout my entire life. I've also really learned from Drill Sergeant Bryant, that you can set those really high expectations for people, even if they're a little unrealistic and that people can grow and learn from them. It's not, you're not just being a jerk. You're not just being mean, like having really high expectations, as long as you can communicate them clearly, like what you're doing and why you're doing it um, can really help other people face that uncomfortable situation and grow from it. Mm, that's really interesting because as yeah. I'm thinking about that, I, I, and I've never been in the military. I would have probably kicked out in six minutes or six hours. I don't know. One two. Uh, Brian would not have liked me. Uh, so, but I'm curious, I'm assuming that when you're in the military, you're given a goal. Hey, go do 40 push-ups. Yep. Unlike in a company environment where, where, where from a buy-in process, it might be, look here, how many push-ups do you think you can do? I can do 40. Can you push it to 50? Let's, what if you really stretch? Like the process is, is maybe a little different or not. What are you, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Oh, that's such a good point. Um, and I think, you know, I also credit a lot of my success to one of my now business partners. He was previously my leader, Carrie Rosenblum, and he did the same thing. He was a lot of people would say he's actually pretty irrational in his expectations. He just sets extremely high, high standards and expects you to do whatever you can to achieve them. I think that it is, it, in my experience, I've learned that it's more about understanding the person on your team, what motivates them, how to help push them, how to help drive them. There are some people who need that push. There are some people who you need to be able to say who you who need you to say, I need you to achieve this. And they're going to look at you and say, I can't. And then you have to say, how can you? Like, I hear you now think you can't, but what do you need to get there? Like, let's talk through those things. And then there are, and that motivates them. And then there are others who you need to actually go to them and say, like, this is the overall goal. How, what are the things that you think you need to accomplish in order to get there? And then work through those. And I think it's more about understanding 
the, what motivates each member of your team and how they operate best, and then leading them specifically in the corporate world, as opposed to, you know, in the military, you really have to be able to, you know, apply one standard to hundreds of people in order to accomplish the goal. So let's go a little bit into that topic. Um, and we'll, we'll eventually get back to what happened at the military. So I won't lose yeah. sight of that, yeah. but, but I want to stay on this. How do you do that? How are you doing that today? Carrie, how are you figuring out what motivates different team members? What 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 tools, what strategies are you using? Because you kind of have to get to it pretty quickly. I joined the company, um, and, and and actually, are you doing that on 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 the application and the interview? Like walk 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 through uh, kind of your strategy around that. Yeah, honestly, Ron, we're not doing it holistically as well as we should today. In fact you said something so important. We should be doing this on the front end. Um, actually, when I read your book, I think the chapter eight, maybe, um, step four or five um, is where you talk about how important it is through the interview and onboarding process to really get to know the person and make sure that they're the right fit for your company throughout that process. And you had it so many um really phenomenal, very prescriptive ways to do that. And some of which we're actually in the process of implementing at Fortress right now, but we're not good at that, to be honest with you. So I, I shouldn't speak to it. What we have been really good at is extreme transparency and vulnerability at a top level so that team members feel comfortable sharing who they are, asking the right questions, being vulnerable and transparent back with us. And that's how we get to know them. And for us, that starts a lot with our leadership team being self-aware. So that is something that's so important to me. Everyone on my executive leadership team has to be extremely self-aware, know what they're good at, know what they're not good at, be honestly, be externally honest about that, admit their mistakes, current and past, ask questions, be vulnerable about what they're not sure about. Those sorts of things for me, if you can create that culture at the top, then then you people very quickly open up and you can really start to see who they are and what they need to be successful. Well, I love that. And and look, you you in real time practice what you preach, i.e., look, we're not great at that. There's room for improvement. And so that shows yeah. that you live that that is hardwired in your DNA, yeah. that vulnerability and authenticity, right? Which is fantastic, Carrie. And you know, it's funny, it's it's probably annoying to me sometimes when I get on a podcast and and I sometimes let people off, which I'll ask a question and they just start running a little bit away from the answer. It's like, look, I've just, it, whether say whether they would just have no idea, don't even know the answer. That's a great answer, you know? Um, so anyways, I really appreciate you saying that. And and that's the exciting part of building a business is, is figuring yeah. out the next puzzle piece and how to put it in and get better at putting it in, right? Which is exciting. So yeah, it, it, you know, and I, and I think back to that strategy and we, we probably shifted a, a bit and I can't remember all, all the details in the book, but on the motivation side, you know, sometimes I'll poke at what motivates someone at work. And then sometimes I'll poke at what motivates them personally, or, or probably both do both. And just because uh, in some cases, I find that their past work environment may not be an environment that was motivating to them. And they might not have found motivation there. So a great example would be, um, we're going to hire an operations person, and they, uh, they are motivated through being involved in the ideation and 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 decision making process for strategy, and in the last company that was there in a box that is not going to happen. So it was demotivating for them. That's why they're at the interview, and so sometimes it could be hard to find that because they couldn't do it where where you know they, they didn't have the autonomy to or environment to do that. And so I'll poke on the personal side and say, what motivates you personally? And a lot of times in that situation, be where someone was able to do a process, you know, build a garage for themselves and and be on the ground and be on the, the strategic decision of where the garage is going to go. And they get really motivated by that. And it's like, okay, that motivates you. It's, it's, it's interesting. You know, there's always this, the authentic human will tell the answer, you know, versus sometimes the, 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 the person at work. What are your thoughts? Oh, on that? I love that so much. And actually that's a little validating for me because I said, we're not the best at interviewing, but there's two interview questions that I always force our teams to ask. Um, first, what motivates you as a person and second, what frustrates you as a person and just understand. And I always try to ask my team to give, to give the, the candidate who's interviewing examples. Like, you know, I always say for what really frustrates me is when you don't, 
uh, is honestly when people don't try hard enough. Like it doesn't matter whether they actually know how to accomplish the goal, but they have to give it their all. Like you have to give 110% or it's not a good fit at Fortress. So that really frustrates me as a human. Um, and so just sharing your motivators and frustrations as a human with the, another human really helps them open up and share those things back with you. Um, so I agree with that. You know, it's so funny that you bring up this specific conversation because if there is one part of your book that actually stood out to me, you're probably going to laugh about what this is. Um, but it was when your security company had purchased another security company and you were on site and there was a um, individual who was of course coming over with the transition, who was with that prior company, who came up to you and asked you what you were going to do about the vehicle situation. Like they needed a new vehicle on the property, right? And he was like, this one is like, has a lot of trouble. It doesn't do all the things that we need. Like we need a new one. And you just said, well, do you want to go find that one? And he was like, oh my gosh, absolutely. I will go find it. I will figure this out. I will come back to you on it. And you, because you were there and because you allowed him to express like his interests and what mattered to him and then empowered him to go do that thing, you built an employee who will back you, a team member who will back you for life in that moment. And then you brought that back to your corporate office. And there was someone at the corporate office who didn't love that, who was like, you know what, hold on, hold on. Purchasing assets is my job. And you're like, ah, who cares? Like the guy's like on site, he's mod motivated about it. Like we're going to build value in him for life if we just let him do this thing for us. And he was like, it doesn't matter. It's my job. Like, that's what I'm supposed to do. And in that moment, when I read that passage, I was like, it's so blatantly clear, like who is going to be there with you in the next two to three years and who isn't, Right. Um, and because it does matter what actually motivates people and whether or not, you know, they're, they're, you know, that person in your corporate office, he should have been motivated by the fact that you empowered someone on site who is now motivated, who's going to be with you forever and sing your praises and be a phenomenal team member. But instead he was motivated by himself, by his power and by what he wanted to accomplish. Totally. You know, shout out to Ashwani who hopefully he's listening. I know he'd listen sometimes. I still, I still talk to Ashwani. He's still mm -hmm. in Ontario. And so, but you know, you, you Love it. bring an interesting point, which is, um, which is the interesting part about communicating with other humans. And in this case, um, sometimes, you know, if you think of the level of motivation, right. And so it's like, you know, you ask me if I want to go buy the vehicle. I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure. It's like, okay, that was flat. And so yeah. motivation, you can really tell the level of motivation by a couple of things. One energy shift. Yep. tone shift, right? Body language. And the, those things are actually going to bring it up. You know, like I, when I tell that story, it's like a swine now it was on the phone, but I could feel his energy. He's like, sir, yeah. I will not let you down. I'm going to pick up the best damn car. I mean, he was, he was mm -hmm. so passionate. It came out. And so sometimes it's not the, um, sometimes we have to look beyond the words of like, yeah, okay. Sounds good. Well, okay. That's, <laughs> that, we're not going to find a good car, you know? Um, and Carrie, I was thinking too, to your question, and you know, there was a question I used to ask, which which might touch on motivation. I don't ask anymore. I'm wondering that when you said you had a, um, uh, you know, the question, first you're vulnerable, which is great, and what motivates you, and then you ask them. But one question I used to ask, which I might bring it back, which was, okay, you know, you're in the interview, Carrie, uh, if you were to go to a deserted island for the rest of your life, and you can't bring another person, but you can only bring one item. What is it? And I think back to all the different answers of that, which kind of in some cases showed you at the core who someone was. You know, so for instance, uh, some people would say my favorite book is X and bring that. They love to learn, they love to educate. And so that was obvious. Jackknife, they are problem solvers. They're gonna bring a jackknife, mm -hmm. they're gonna sort things out. Uh, they, you know, the best one, which I didn't hire a guy, said I bring a sofa. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Okay. okay, you like to relax. Good to know. <laughs> uh, anyways, I might bring that question back. Uh, so let's go back to, uh, I want to go back because I don't want to miss a military thing. I don't want to miss uh, the carry story. So go back to broke two feet and keep moving. And then we'll see what else, what, what gets peppered along the way. Yeah, so I ended up graduating law school. And when I did, this is in 2009, when I did, um, my husband was actually working for a Department of State contractor in Iraq. So 
I decided um, I received an opportunity to actually work for them in Iraq uh, and decided to go do that with my husband. So I was wow. mostly managing um, logistics, HR, accounting type things. And I wasn't, I, I definitely wasn't headed out into the, the um, dangerous areas uh, while I was there. I, I was in the green zone the entire time, mostly in bunkers. Um, but it was a pretty big company full of ex, expats who, um, you know, were, were essentially there to guard the U.S. ambassador and it, his guests at the, um, at the embassy in Iraq. And it was a really interesting experience. Um, from there, I um, came back to the U.S. when my husband and I found out that we were uh, going to be having a child. Um, and then ended up working for a Fortune 500 company at the time, a recruiting firm. And then, of course, found my way to Elmington, where I eventually uh, decided to build Fortress. But I think what's really interesting, like when I look back over that <laughs> very almost schizophrenic career, I was kind of all over the place. Um, it, I had such a phenomenal opportunity to work for very different groups. Um, while I was in law school, I actually worked for a couple of uh, um, small law firms, um, so like three to five people. I was, of course, in the mil in the army for a period of time. I was in, worked for a Department of State contractor for a period of time. Um, worked for a Fortune 500 company, then came and worked with just a small real estate office of just the four partners and myself. And really, what I learned throughout a lot of that and a theme in my life has always been that uh, I wanted to be surrounded by, I'm an overachiever, a huge overachiever, quite frankly, sometimes it's just as so much a fault as it is a, a pro in my life. But um, I wanted to be surrounded by other overachievers. It didn't matter like what type of company I was in, how big it was or what we were doing. If I was surrounded by other overachievers who were giving as much as I was every day and just as passionate and motivated, then I was happy and I felt successful. But when I wasn't, I was miserable. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think you, it is a schizophrenic career, but there's always been a little bit of a theme for me as to you know what worked and what didn't work. And then why I say I've just been a little bit of a troublemaker. I need to dig in. I need to dig in that. You're not getting off the hook with the <laughs> side. Um, so, so what about the journey made culture be, and, and, and I'm making this assumption because you have a great culture, front and center yeah. foundational to Fortress because there was there ups, downs. Can I give us some color of why so important to ensure your company had incredible culture? A lot miss it, you know? Yeah, I honestly think I fell into it really just by luck. So as I was you know, really growing in my career, I started reading a lot of books. And one of my favorite books um, is from Good to Great. And there's a quote inside of Good to Great that actually isn't attributed to someone. Um, but it is a quote that um, that Collins picked up somewhere. And what he said was, um, the quote that he had heard was that the only true way to reward your overachievers is by not burdening them with underachievers. And I think that I fell into creating culture with that being my guiding light, that if I ensured that I was always surrounding my overachievers with other overachievers, and of course I had experienced that very similarly in my own life, my own like happiness or unhappiness at certain companies, that I could create a group of people who were so happy coming to work every day that it didn't matter what we were doing, we were going to be productive and effective. And and I'll be completely honest, we haven't always been the best at creating structure around that. But the thing is, if you have really great people and you're open and transparent about who's good at what, what they're not good at, and then also very quickly realizing who doesn't fit and moving them along as quickly as possible, um, then the culture starts to define itself at a really high level, even without a bunch of intentionality. Now we, we are working on that um, and we should be working on that. So I don't, I don't want to dismiss it, but I think that the crux of culture is the people, the, your culture is defined by who you, who you bring on board um, and who you allowed to say, who you allowed to say. So I, I agree with that, although I'll, I'll say, I'm, or I guess I'm curious about, has this happened or what, what happens if this happens, which is, you know, in some cases, the high performance can also bring out the selfish ego. I'm just using those two words, right? Mm -hmm. I, so I join your company. Yep. I don't give a damn about the Fortress team. I'm here to perform. 
And that may bring out the best in some people, maybe, maybe not, but, but I win and you lose. And so, and so, so what's the balance with, I'm going to win and for, I don't like Fortress is second in the team, but Ron Lovett's going to win here. What do you do there in that situation? You know, because, and, 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 you know, I know it's gray because maybe I'm passive aggressive, uh, et cetera, but you know, you, you know what I'm poking at, you know, that, that, that's a very common thing where all of a sudden we have pressure from um, to grow the business and you have this egotistic individual who's just says, I'm going to win at all costs. And so the balance of, oh dear, without Ron Lovett, who just closed a million dollar account, but he's not jumping with this team, but he's performing very high from the results in the position, not, he doesn't align with the culture. Have you dealt with that? And what are your thoughts? Absolutely. It's hard. There's no getting around it. In fact, even just taking a step back from that, Ron, I would say it is just hard to fire people, period. It doesn't matter whether they're super high performers or they're not. It's just hard. So I, the first thing that I always say, in fact, at Elmington Property Management, which was the property management company uh, that actually was just announced uh, for the first time ever, that it is on the a National Multifamily Housing Council in the U.S.'s uh, top 50 list, which is wow. fantastic. I'm so proud Great. of them. Um, still a partner in that company, but I don't I don't have any daily responsibilities over there. Um, but when I was growing that company, we scaled from about 5,000 units under management to about 27,000 in about five years. Um, one of our core values, we had seven of them, things like forget the ordinary and think like an owner, a few others. But one of them was actually move people along. And that was a very controversial value um, in an industry that is quite transient and very decentralized. And it's just, it, you know, it's controversial anyway, but we really leaned in to the fact that the quicker you move along the wrong person, the better your team will be, period. And we lean into focusing away from the individual, the person that you're firing. Don't focus on that person. Don't don't put your empathy there. Don't, don't put your, you know, all of your time and energy there, put your time and energy into the team. And if the team will be better when this person is gone, that's where you're focusing your empathy and your time and your energy. And so if you can do that, if you can shift the focus from the person to the team, then it's a lot easier to fire people and it's a lot easier to move them along. Now, obviously to your point, when there is an extremely high performer, that can be really difficult. You know, and I would honestly actually say the same about a client. So I would honestly put those in the same boat, an extremely high performing team member and an extremely lucrative, lucrative client. But at the end of the day, if either of them are more concerned about themselves than the team, more focused on what they need to do and who they are as humans, rather than what the company needs or the rest of their team member success, then it's at the end of the day, it's toxic and you need to let them go as quickly as possible because they will hinder your long-term success. So I, I agree fully with what you're saying. I'm just, I'm curious and, and, and this changes, but I want to dig into the process because I love the topic, right? And so let's, yeah. you know, and without naming, oh, I fired Johnny and threw him out the door. Let's just generalize, yeah. but you get detailed enough to, to bring some color into the discussion. Can you give examples of when this went very well? And I can think of some myself. I'll do the same. We'll exchange some information. And and somewhere, yeah. it, maybe it didn't go well. It just didn't. And, and the lesson learned from there. Yeah. Um, that Fortune 500 company that I worked for uh, before I came to Elmington was actually a recruiting and staffing company. So I was a headhunter. And during that time, I had to be a part of the process of firing a lot of people. So I don't, I don't mean to say that I you know, have more experience than anyone else, but it was an, a, a very intense experience of letting people go uh, through that company. And in that, I did learn a lot about how the art of letting someone go to the point where, Ron, I'm actually a big fan of coaching someone through to the point of them giving notice rather than even needing to fire them. And it can be done it can actually be done really efficiently um, and in a really um, in a really focused and structured way that benefits everyone. Um, and that actually doesn't even require a two week notice at that point, which I also don't love. I don't believe in. Um, and so I think if you can you know, get that person to see what they are doing right well, what's not going well, and like push on that constantly and get them to see that they would have a better 
long-term future, if they found a better fit for themselves. So like saying things to them, like, this is a really great example. Um, we, we had a member of a sales team, a member of our sales team here at Fortress who was with us for about six months. And during that time, we really realized that while he was fantastic at his other companies, his other companies were really big structure. Like they had had their sales motion in place for decades, not, you know, two years in our case. Um, so decades, not months. And he came to Fortress and he was so motivated and so passionate, but he really just started to fall apart. And it was really easy for me to see from the outside that it was because we lacked that decades of experience and training and structure. We didn't have the answer to everything yet. And he needed that. He preferred kind of that box of sales. He knew exactly what he was selling, how he was saying it, the scripted message. And we were still kind of figuring it out. So there's you know, a lot you know, of entrepreneurs. I like to call this Europe pirate ship. He's looking for a Navy ship. Keep yes. Going yes. So well said. So well said. I'm going to steal that. Um, and, you know, we coached him through that and, you know, he was so sad. And I was like, you don't need to be sad. You are going to be so successful. You're, you're awesome. You just need to find the right ship in your case, the right ship for you. And so those, that conversation went really well. Um, I think the times when it doesn't go well, um, a lot of times I think it's when people aren't capable of, of being self-aware, of truly accepting either the, who they are as a person or even accepting who Fortress is. It's like they're the type of people who just feel like they can push a round peg into a square hole if they just try hard enough rather than kind of backing up and, and seeing the whole picture. Um, and those don't, don't go very well. Um, I won't lie, but I, I'm, in, I'm very interested to hear your experiences on this too. Yeah. You know, and it's interesting uh, because there, you can, in some cases, box this put put people into to a box of a situation, not into a box. It's a wrong, uh, probably wrong word. But what I mean by that is, um, you know, because I'm just making some notes as you were talking, and I think back to also when I got it right, when I got it wrong. And again, every situation there might be uh, themes is a better word, but they're all different. Like let's be honest, right? And so the number one thing that I think about of when I got it right and got it wrong was actually me and it was was what we talked about when we when we kicked things off it was being honest yeah and and i'll tell you this came up in a forum group that uh that i'm in an international kind of entrepreneur group and we were talking about this uh, a few weeks ago and talking about tough conversations which are what you have to do if, if you're going to let someone go and and so when it didn't i'll start with when it didn't go well and then i go to some maybe examples of when i think it went fairly well similar to what you talked about. And so when it hasn't gone well, I've let a relationship get in front of me being honest. And so interesting enough, if you think logically about that, the more I know you carry, the more honest I should become with you in a kind way. But as humans, we actually say, you know what, I'm not going to have that tough chat with Carrie because we have beers on Thursday. Our kids know each other. This is, we, we've kind of gone into friendship zone. We respect each other too much. That's a huge mistake that I've made uh, where I've, I've put honesty behind a relationship and it's like, man, that, that's, that, that hit me big uh, in, in an issue I had um, with parting ways with someone not too long ago, because it also wasn't fair to the individual. As tough as that might've been, I should have been way more honest, knew it, should have talked about it. And I paid for that later, you know, because um, I think also when it goes well, doesn't go well, it, when it doesn't go well, if there's a lack of self-awareness on the other side and someone says, no, I'm very good for this role. And you see that maybe they're not. And so trying to get, trying to bridge the gap is, is challenging. And, and, and so, yeah, so, so being honest in, and, you know, that's a broader term, but that's what I've seen uh, absolutely because I've been so much on or so faster with with people I don't have long standing relations with. And of course, I think what's what's worked well is I'm going to say autonomy and empathy. And they touch to what you you talked about. Empathy being like, look, Carrie, um, I know that working at Vita, I can just see the stress it's causing you. And 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 look, that is not the environment we're looking to have for you and your family. It can't be good on your partner. It's probably yeah. going to affect your children. Let's be honest. I'm assuming you've lost some sleep here. That's not the environment. I, I think you would feel big weight lifted off your chest if it was time to move on. And a lot of times that's going to be true. 
But what I buckle on to that one, Carrie, which is which is I think is important, is as leaders, if I brought you on the organization or my organization that I own, the majority of has brought you here, then I have a responsibility that the organization does to find you a new home. And this is where I would probably work a little harder than, than, than some of my peer entrepreneurs. And they may not agree with this, but I work very hard to say, and Carrie, I'm going to help you find that home. I can't get you the job, but I can open my, I can open my contacts and let's have a discussion. I'm actually going to spend some time about the right zone for you. Cause I always talk about this platinum or, or this triangle, uh, platinum triangle is a little different, but, but this triangle of like when someone's in the strike zone of work and, and there's typically three things it's, I love my leader and leadership. I love the company culture and I love what I do. If you get all three of those, it's on. We, we're we thick as thieves. No one's going anywhere if that stays. If one breaks down, it's death by a thousand cuts. Three, you're out of here fast. Two, a little faster. One, I don't, I love uh, you as a leader. I love the company culture. Don't love what I do. It's death by a thousand cuts, right? And so I generally use that as guidance, say, where is this missing? Where is this missing? And, and by the way, sometimes as a leader, it's not the leader you're looking for because maybe I push you too hard. Maybe that raw feedback you don't like, there could be disconnects as a leader. It doesn't mean because I can lead some people, I can lead everybody. And I think that's a thing I continue to look in the mirror on. And so also when it's gone well, so it's empathy, uh, being being realistic and um and, 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 you know, and being raw and, and compassionate about what their next home is. And so I always do that and, and help find people a new home. And, you know, I, I let a senior leader go not too long ago. And, and, and I think this works quite well because the other thing I was um, referring to was autonomy. And in this conversation, it was different than most I've had. I, we, had we, we had had some challenges that I saw. And the conversation started a little different than, than I've done in the past. What I did is I sat the individual down. And I, on the, on a whiteboard, I wrote Vita 5,000 units in Can in Atlantic Canada, Vita 10,000 units in Canada and Vita a hundred thousand across the globe. And I said, who, which company do you work for and why in the same role that you have today? And I knew right away that that was over. I just knew we, we, we have to have the same vision for what we, how we want to play ball with this company and, or how we want to connect to it. And I knew, and then when I, when I'm using the word autonomy, you know, uh, and empathy too, we talked about the, the challenges and how we landed, where we ended, which, which worked out very well for, for both, uh, was look, I'm, if you want this, the hundred thousand, and you want to get in front of the challenges that we're discussing today, then I'll work very hard for you. I'll meet with you once a week. We'll get an outside, outside coach. We will invest in your training, but I want you to take a week with you, your family, you decide whether that's it because I'll invest and I'm all in if you tell me, let's do this. But if not, you hang up your gloves. And so that's what I'm talking about autonomy. That worked very well. The, the individual came back and said, I, 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 I'm going to hang up the gloves. And, and of course, very successful from start to finish, help find them a, a, a job with a supplier um, where I spent time on Saturday debating with the supplier on whether they were the right role or not for the third role and he was the right role in this case. And so, you know, that was, a, that was a great flywheel. It worked out quite well. It doesn't always work out well, by the way, but um, because there, there's a lot of emotions involved and that's where things become unpredictable because we as humans show up a little differently based on emotion. So those were probably two, um, I, I, I think it's empathy and autonomy. If you can, you, you do it to your point. If someone can self-select out and they have the, autonomy to do that it, it usually works out better because i always and and this is important too we've also made the mistake with the conversation that you're not ready for so if nothing's led up to that and you're not ready for it we own that and, and we'll have uh, whether it's leadership or operations whoever it is the one question i'll ask is is carrie ready for this no she's not then 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 it's 90 days to carry here's some issues and let's agree in advance that if we can't hit this we find you a new home. We'd have the pre, I talk about that in the book, the pre-firing or pre-offboring. I don't know what verbiage I use. So you know then, and a lot of times you'll say, okay, I'm not hitting it. I'm going to leave, you know? And so that pre, what does the end look like breakup in advance before we're breaking up has always been helpful, but very messy topic. What, what else are you thinking? You know, uh, anything else come to mind of working, not working? Yeah. So I, I love what you said. And honestly, um, in your book, you mentioned that you've never been sued by an employee who has left, which is 
phenomenal. I cannot yeah. say the same uh, for all of my companies. Not, not that you I live in the United States. States, Gary. That's different. In Canada, we don't <laughs> sue. <laughs> we are so litigious. <laughs> That is absolutely true. Um, but I still think that that's really meaningful, um, you know, that you've been able to treat your team members with, I would add the word to autonomy, the word like dignity, right? So giving someone the opportunity to walk away of their own accord gives them so much, allows them to walk away with so much dignity. Um, and they, to your point, they also saw it coming the whole way, right? They felt it, they saw it, they were involved in the decision-making process. And then it was, it's a, such a comfortable situation. And now we're friends afterward, right? Right. Um, and so I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I honestly think, um, this is something that we coach on internally. You know, you mentioned, um, being so close to someone that you let it go on for too long because y it was almost a friendship. So you weren't honest with them. Um, we repeat, we have a, a, almost like a ritual inside of Fortress where we repeat over and over and over again, that the, the best way to be kind to someone is to be honest with them. You know, if you put yourself in their shoes for a minute, just forget the person, but you put yourself in their shoes. If your leader has feedback that they could share with you that could help you grow and that are things that you could improve upon or do better or that you need to hear in order to progress in your career, how would you feel if they didn't share that with you? You know, like we, we really harp on this. It's so big to us. And I think it's because early on in my career, I had some leaders who did not share those things with me. You know, I was a troublemaker. I was tenacious. I was constant. I was really feisty. I mean, I, at that fortune 500 company, I was at one time I pulled my boss into a conference room in the middle of the day. And I was like, look, the person who's sitting next to me sucks at their job. I mean, they suck. Like they're terrible. They're making your life worse my life worse. Like give me their paycheck and I will do my job and their job. And she was like, do you, like, who are you? Like, what are you doing? This is not your love position. It. I love it. <laughs> and I was, but I was so emphatic about it. Right. Um, but she didn't say those things to me. She didn't say those things to him either. The person that I was talking about and it drove me crazy. It was like, just coach us, tell us what we need to do to get better. And so anytime I've had a position of leadership, and especially if I'm leading leaders, it is ritualistic for us that we constantly discuss what people could be doing better, what they need to improve, how they could be promoted more quickly, how they could earn more money. Like, what is it that they need to do? That's being kind. And if you really think about it, how you would want your leader to talk to you and treat you and manage you, you would want all those things too. So stop thinking about those as hard conversations or difficult conversations. They're the kind conversation. And if you can reframe that mentally, it's so much easier to do. You know, you're right. And, and let's go in there too, because of course, firing is a difficult conversation, but yes. when you say reframe. I mean, I think you're, 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 you're spot on. Look, the idea behind um, a tough conversation, the gold standard star should be that Carrie, you and I had a tough conversation and you left the conversation feeling better than before you walked in gold standard. Then the question is, how do you get there? Right. The framing. And so let's chat about that too. Um, because this is tough, whether you're talking to someone to be more innovative, solve a problem, deal with a coworker, how do you deal with tough conversations? What are some of the things you think about prep for tools, hacks you use? Just curious in general. Yeah, there was a, um, a book I read. Oh my goodness. The name is going to, I think actually, I think it was in the culture code, which I don't know if you've read it, but it's a phenomenal book. I feel like I did culture code. Who wrote Culture. Oh, you're gonna have to give me a minute to figure that one out. But anyways, we'll, we'll um, but huge part of the conversation in the culture code is around you know believing in your team member. So there's a, obviously there's a disconnect between your intention and your impact always. But if you can relay your intention with such clarity, you can actually ch change the the impact of it. And a really great use case that's been studied is that one of the best ways that teachers have been able to transform their classes into paying more attention to them is if the, if the teachers start the class every day by saying, I am here to do this for you because I believe in you. 
Like, I'm not doing this because this is my job. I'm not doing this because someone handed me a curriculum to teach. I'm here to teach you because I truly believe that you can learn these things and that you can take them into the world and be successful. And if you just tell people you believe in them, then it completely transforms the impact that your hard conversation has. So that's something that we always start with, which is when someone, when I have to have a hard conversation with someone, especially if I'm doing it directly, I always start with, look, my time is very valuable to me. And if I didn't believe in you, and if I didn't believe that you had the ability to take the feedback that I'm going to give you and use it and become more successful and become a long-term valuable you know, team member at Fortress, I would not be sharing this with you. It's not easy. It's not quick. Like this is a huge chunk of my time and energy that I'm investing in you, but it's because I believe in you or I wouldn't be doing it. And then you share the thing. And if you can do that, you immediately reframe their mindset. So now they're not thinking, oh, she's here to get on to me. She's here to help me. Like she wants me to succeed and she believes I can do it. And that's something that we always, that we talk about and really encourage. I love that. And I, I love the story with the teacher. I think if there's any teacher yeah. listening to this, or if you want to tag a teacher below, I, I, I think that, because you're right, it's intent. Of course, you have to show up and back up the intent to show that that's how you really act as a human. Um, you know, and I, I learned, uh, and I wrote about this in my book on building relationships uh, chapter, I think, but that framework, and I've learned so much because even I, I feel like that framework has been updated and upgraded since on my own experience. But so I, I, it's exactly what you're talking about. So it's preparing in advance. What's the intent, which is confusing. And I, I want to poke at that a little bit. What are the outcomes of the conversation? And then the most important one that I learned, not no, most important, but equally, or, or the, the one that was most helpful to me was how do I want that person to experience me, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the reason I like that is because probably similar, we're, we're probably similar. I mean, I just saw you get super hot when you went back to that, I mean, you were going to punch your old boss in the face because you wanted the other paycheck of me. So I know now the trouble, chick carry that I'm going to be careful of, uh, but I've got it too. I'm the Irish, you know, uh, yeah. and I'm, I pound the table, passionate, Yep. And that's not necessarily how I want someone to experience me in this tough yeah. conversation environment. It's, I want, you know, because the question is, you know, Carrie had a tough conversation with Ron Lovett and, and you bump into uh, MK down the hall who works on your team. How did that chat go with Ron? Whoa, man, he is intense. No, 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 that's not what I'm looking for. That could happen. I'm looking for, if I think about how I want that so someone to experience me, it's, he was, you know, it, it was a tough conversation. He really listened. He was compassionate. He cared. I know he cares about me and my family. And he was very empathetic to what's going on with me at home. Boom, nailed it, right? And and the intent, because the outcomes are the outcomes. You didn't call your customers back. You know, we, that's the logical stuff, the things that we're here to talk about and to make the adjustments on that we believe that you can adjust on. But the intent gets messy. And it's funny because I, I I do this workshop Sometimes when I talk and, and, and I'll do, say, okay, we're going through a cuffs on conversation, prepare. Here's the situation. It's intent, outcome, experience, and, and we'll role play. We go back and forth. And what the most common thing that I see is the misuse of intent, because you pointed out earlier, Carrie, the intent has to be for your good, right? Because if you were talking to me and the intent was to make fortress better, that has nothing to do with lifting me up. To back to the what those that teacher said to those students it's Ron the intent is that you have an incredible experience here at Fortress and and you become the best salesperson that you can be no matter where you go in life now whoa that, that's not about Fortress that's not about you you're pissing me off that's about me that that's interesting where I've gone wrong on that one two three play there's two things that I now do one is a big look in the mirror one is looking at outside the mirror and what I mean by that is I remember during the pandemic having a tough conversation uh, with an individual and I go through this play. I'm ready. Like I, I, I prep every time intent, make sure I get it right. Outcome. Okay. Experience, spend some time on that love and care. I have a list. It's 10 miles long. And so anyway, I get into it and it's not working. It's a female. She's having a complete meltdown. Nothing that I'm saying is landing. I'm questioning yep. this whole process. Do I throw it out? Usually it worked. Yep. What happened? I thought I was beginning my becoming a master at this. The check-in of where someone is emotionally was missing. And so come to find out her kids were up for four nights in a row. She's got three children. 
she's stressed, there's financial things uh -huh. going on. No matter what I say, Kara, it didn't matter. Yeah. So, so now I do a pre-check-in. This is the one looking out the window where I'll say, hey, Carrie, like, look, I'd like to have a conversation about a few different things that I think will be helpful to you. So I'd like to provide some feedback that I think is incredibly helpful. Or how, how, but before we do that, how are you doing? Like, is things cool? You, you feeling okay? Because I, I want you to be in a good state of mind for this. And, and that would be the best uh, format possible. How are you? And you might say, oh, you know, today I just had a shit day. I'd say, you know what? This is not that important. I'll get to you next week. Let's check in. So that's one side. I do a pre-check-in. Seems like a lot of friggin' work, but it, it works. The second one I do, I do myself because whatever, sometimes what I want to talk to you about, you, you, I'm just picking up, we're having fun here, have pissed me off so bad. I'm you in that boardroom. I'm like, I'm out for blood, right? <laughs> and until I can get to a calm state that I'm not losing sleep over because I get really fussed when I'm upset, especially someone who's closer to my circle, rub me the wrong way, I need time. And so, you know, Hugh, if you're listening, uh, who's on my team, I remember we had a we had a, a a chat not too long ago, and I waited like a week. He just it wasn't it was unintentional. He rubbed me the wrong way, and I waited literally two or three weeks. And I and I would sit, tell him, I'm talking to you now because I, I love you again. I'm good, and and yeah. and so I'm making sure that thought that baggage that I had from that feeling because that's gonna come out too. I can't tuck that away. So I do both sides or try my best, by the way, I'm not perfect at this. Um, and then the only thing I'm going to wrap on that too, uh, which is the pre, because uh, I, I assume, Carrie, you're a fast moving entrepreneur like me and you feel something and it's visceral and you need to move fast. And I learned this years ago when I was 21, I was at this conference and this CFO, I forget his name. He runs a big company now. I think he's the president of the company. Uh, he said, look, one thing I've learned is before I open my mouth, I ask myself three questions. Is what I'm about to say, should it be said by me? Should it be said at all? And should it be said right now? And I was like, oh, that's a good one. You know, because most times should be said by me, should be said at all. Yes, it needs to be said, but not right now. Just not right now, right? And, and oh, by the way, that works in my relationship too. And with, you know, with my children, right? And so- yep. You kind of mash these things together and and usually shoot about 80 percent. so i mess up stuff all the time but uh yeah it's it's a very interesting topic because you are dealing with you're trying to avoid the motion the emotional side of someone and that's why that clearing around i think has been helpful and get to the logical brain that then someone self-selects out they understand that you know uh yeah any thoughts Oh my gosh. I couldn't agree more. I absolutely love that pre-check-in. Um, I think that's so smart and it is not something that we're doing and I'm taking it back to my team because you're right. You have no idea whether or not someone else is capable of receiving the information you're about to share. You can and should, to your point, know whether or not you're capable of doing it. Um, and I couldn't agree with you more. Um, this is actually more impactful in my personal life than it is in my professional life that you know, we all have this inner dialogue and we have these thoughts that run through our head that create emotions that we can't always control. I mean, the best we can do is manage them, but the, the thing that we can always do is manage our reaction to them. We can't manage, the, we can't control the thoughts. We can barely manage the emotions. What we can manage is how we respond. And to your point, like taking that time in between the emotion and the fire and that feeling and the actual response, like putting that a long pause, maybe it's a week, maybe it's two weeks if it needs to be in order to have that conversation is 100% um, the right way to handle those, those situations. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, in fact, meditation has taught me uh, so much on that. And then I will comment on your uh, by me at all. And right now, look, something else that I've learned that really is so mind blowing to me is that in, especially in the United States in our education system, we spend a lot of time focusing on three of the four components of communication. So there's four critical components of communication, reading, writing, speaking, and listening. And yet there's one that is arguably the most important that we do not teach at all, listening. Instead, we are all listening to respond. We're not listening to hear, to understand, to empathize. We're just listening to respond. I mean, even in my own life, I find myself doing this constantly and it almost frustrates me that 
as people are talking, I'm while they're talking, I'm thinking about what I'm going to say next. And I'm like, whoa, stop it. What are you doing? Like, just listen to them. Like you don't, who cares what you're thinking or what you want to say next? Just listen. Um, and so I couldn't agree with that more. I'm, I'm a firm believer in you know, managing your mind as much as possible and learning these things and understanding like who we are as humans and how we can be better humans. And, and those are, I think, really great examples of that. You know, and thanks for bringing that up. And, and look, a lot of entrepreneurs, some some of us have ADHD. We certainly move fast. So so that reaction, and we're problem solvers. It comes from yep. a good place. I want to help you. I know this. Two plus two is four. You know, we don't need to do yep. this anymore. I got to get to lunch. You know? <laughs> so yes. it's, I mean, if you crack that code, you know, I, I would like to co-author that book with you because that, <laughs> you know. You know, and I think back to that, and I'm so bad at that too, Carrie. So you're you are not alone. And I think of like, what do I do? And you know, the only two things that I do sometimes, by the way, I only shoot about forty percent on this one. Uh, but sometimes, because I'm a hand talker, I sit on my hands because if I sit on my hands, my mouth will stay shut because I use my hands. So that's one I love that I use. And by the way, most times I forget to do that. Uh, the other one I try to do is visualize myself in the back of the class that just can't interrupt. I just can't like the teacher environment where you're in the back of the class, you kind of have to put your hand up, you know, if you, if you can get yep. there, yep. don't I shoot 10% on that one. I don't do well, but they, they, they work if I get there. So yeah. Terry, fantastic. Anything else that you want to add that we didn't talk about today that's come up? Um, we, I, I love the, the discussion. We've gone deep on some really critical topics for people. Anything else we didn't get to talk about that you're like, ah, there was this thing that I wanted to get out there or how do you go ahead? Yeah. So the last thing that I'll leave with, um, I'm a huge reader and I love it when people share um, book recommendations with me. And something that we talked about a little bit here that I think is just crucial to really evolving as humans and becoming the best people that we can be is embracing being uncomfortable. Um, and that when you are uncomfortable, that is when you grow. That's when you learn. It's when you really evolve. And so there is a book um, that I is probably ranked in my top five books of all time, definitely the best book this year so far, uh, called The Comfort Crisis by Michael Easter. Um, highly recommend it. Loved it. Read it. Loved it. Yeah. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Well, hopefully some of your listeners will, <laughs> will engage yeah. in it. But yeah. That it, was a just, really good book. Yeah. 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 And and just that goes back. You made that point earlier. I think you kicked off with that, which was about that book about just we're so used to like our heated blankies and like, it's like, come on, we are just not ready for, we need to get more uncomfortable in life. Right. That was the premise of the entire book. Yep. Yeah. The more comfortable you can be with being uncomfortable in every right. aspect of your life, the more you grow. And it, everywhere, personally, professionally, like physically, so many ways. Um, and so I just think it's a it's a phenomenal uh, concept that we all should be really thinking about. Well, I'm going to trade you a book, the one I'm into now. I don't know if you've read this. And I have a call out on this podcast because I there's a special individual in that book that I tried to email today, I got a bounce back, but I'm going to find him. This is Alan Mulally. Do you know that name? No, I do not. Alan Mulally, if you're listening, which we'll ensure that you are listening at some point, you're, we're going to get you on this podcast. I can't put the book down. It's American Icon. Oh, and okay. shout out to Sean Buckland, who sent that to me. Uh, it's about Alan Mulally getting pouched from Boeing and saving for it. I can't put it down. You, you should read it, Carrie. It's fantastic. We're going to get Alan on the show. Uh, I'm just so curious because the 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 conversation I'm really curious about with Alan is going into this very Ford culture, protective, uh, you know, a lot of leadership egos just protect my, you know, my desk and what I do and him yeah. having to really build trust and follow me and teamwork. I mean, what the book talks about, I want to go deep into this topic. You, you should grab it. I'll send you a copy. I sent a copy to someone uh, yesterday, uh, George, who owns some Ford dealerships, who who had met Alan a few times. So I said, oh, I'm going to send you this book. It's fantastic. So uh, I highly recommend that. I'm going to send you a copy. I, I, yeah, I got it. Love it. Well, I appreciate it. I actually did just order uh, Nuts yesterday. Um, awesome. After I heard about it for the third time on your uh, podcast with David Friedman. And I was like, that's it. I'm getting it. So I will take all your book recommendations. Huge that's reader. <laughs> well, keep keep me posted on, on books too, because I know you yeah. do a lot of reading. So, so Carrie, look, 
Fantastic conversation. Great Same. to see you. I've got to learn a lot more uh, about you, your leadership style, what you're doing and learning behind the scenes. So thanks for opening up, being vulnerable. Uh, there's gonna That'll be a gift that'll be given to the universe for a long time. So thanks again. Thank you. For more information about Carrie or her work, please follow her on LinkedIn or go to fortresstech.io. To learn more about our books or our Scaling Culture Masterclass on how to build and sustain a resilient, high-performing team, please go to scalingculture.org. And lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a comment and share the podcast with one of your friends or colleagues. We'll be back soon with another incredible guest.